What's happening customers? I know it's been a long time since I actually called you that and I know it's been a long time since you've seen me and I know it's been a long time because you can tell I'm getting a bit old I've got bags under my eyes and you know my hair's gone all black long and I'm growing a banana tree on my head and uh, yeah wrinkles everything you can see them sadly corner shop is over but because of this whole global pandemic I want us to reminisce with you guys while you're at home watching the episodes over and over back to back obviously you got to uh, help me get them views you know what i'm saying and present to you corner shop staff room where i go through every single episode with you talk about the highs the lows and the fun facts and things you may or may not have known while the episodes are being filmed and little little secrets maybe that i haven't revealed before so without further ado let's start with episode three the original two episodes were scrapped because uh, the cast that were in it before decided they no longer wanted to be in it and had other commitments. Um, so I thought it would be best to have like a soft reboot and uh, continue the story, but just take it in a new and a different direction. So I wanted to continue making the episodes really short because obviously, as you can imagine, um, filming them, editing them takes a long time just to do one scene takes ages. First thing I can tell you is the corner shop uniform. The colour combo is from my motherland Bangladesh. Uh, so the red name tag is red and the green uniform obviously. Fun fact, the name tag, I gave it to my mum and my mum actually went to her workplace and laminated it and made it look nice and everything, put the red paper behind it and uh, she did all of that for me. So if you actually go on the end credits and it says Isla's mum, that's the reason why. Every time I bump into someone, a lot of people ask, um, is that corner shop real? Is it yours? Um, is it a family's? Is it a real set? It's a real corner shop. But the mad thing is, from episode three up to episode nine, we used one corner shop, which was a cost cutter all the way in Bedford, which is near Heathrow Airport. So we would travel all the way from South London every time we wanted to film to go all the way there. So literally half of the day would go on journeying there and back. Even if we had like a midday shoot, we'd have to go in the early morning because of the traffic. Prior to that, when I started the series, it was a different corner shop. It was my friend Mozams, uh, who is my friend from college. Um, but then his dad actually sold the shop. So we had to move on to this cost cutter. And cause we were near the airport, um, any scenes we'd film outside or any scene we'd film in the office space in the back of the corner shop, um, we'd have to stop because planes would be landing and they'd be so loud that we'd have to cut sound and literally wait for an opening in between flight times. Imagine we're trying to do a scene and then a plane's flying over and we have to stop. Ah, oh, pain. The memories. Uh, when I started Corner Shop, I was, oh my God, it was 2013 and I'd just finished uni. So I was, what, 21? I'd just finished Mandem on the Wall a year before that. And this was my chance to kind of direct, write and star in something. Um, so at the time, I didn't know many um, actors or like influencers or anyone like that to kind of be on board with the show. So literally, I had a lot of uh, friends that would help me out. Um, God bless them, man, because without them, I probably wouldn't have started. So characters like Dunno Dan, who is my friend Laws from uni. So Malik, mate, your, your refurbs are done. Just need you to sign and date here, pal. Characters like uh, Tariq who's one of my best friends, Kesa, who's also my friend from uni. What's that, man? They literally spent time, they didn't need to, but they just spent time dedicating um, themselves to my project, um, which was very selfless of them. And um, nobody got paid, so there was no incentive, but you know what, they did it for the love of the comedy and they did it for the love of, uh, you know, my, my passion. And uh, they just wanted to see me succeed, so I'll never forget how much they helped me out. And I also had friends behind the scenes helping me out that you wouldn't even know unless you paid attention to the credits. Uh, people like my DOP at the time, Sharad Patel, aka Shaz, and my boy Bilal Shahid. You might know him from his music, um, but Bilal used to actually come down all the way from his ends to uh, the corner shop and just to record sound and hold the boom. You know that boom pole that you hold with the, the, the thing, and you just record sound and you hold it? Bilal will be doing that for me. Literally no pay, man will just turn up and say, bro, what do you need? When my dad finds out, I'm a dead man walking. Malik's character was very cockney. At the time I was working in the Apple store, I was one of two Asians in that store. And there was another Gujarati guy that used to work there and he was full on cockney. So I kind of took the inspiration of Malik from him. And I just tried to flip the script. I didn't want to make him too rolled, which 
I have to admit, I got bored of doing. And uh, if you re if you watch the series, uh, you can kind of see how I transition out of the whole Cockney accent. Um, so yeah, don't point your finger at me for that. Yeah, man, Jalof, me name Jalof, like the rice and peas. Up to this day, people still talk to me about that Jamaican impression, um, and it was fitting so well because I wasn't trying to take the piss. Um, it was literally obviously the health and safety inspector came and I just wanted to pretend it wasn't me. Um, similar to, there's a scene in Phone Shop on Channel 4 when Newman puts on the Jamaican accent. And you know what, I think that happened after Corner Shop, so I don't know who took the inspiration from who. Health and safety inspector, I'm The cleaning song was written uh, by myself and performed by uh, myself and MC Zaini. MC Zaini is a world champion beatboxer uh, who also raps as well. You might have seen him in loads of beatbox clips. <laughs> you might have seen him touring with Jay Sean. Jay Sean. Why thank you. He's such a cool guy man. He actually made the theme song with me. We spent time in the studio together. So he beatboxed the beat and then I'd do the acapellas on top. Let's add another layer. Um, it needs more weight behind it. I might have to add like a wow wow wow. I really wanted to kind of use the trendy acapella vibe instead of like paying for beats because bruv I ain't got no money to make this show and I can't be paying for beats and licenses yeah I wanted to sing some songs in my mother tongue in Siliti because obviously my family my parents are from Bangladesh and this song in particular um, Saaf Khortam was actually inspired by a movie called American Desi they had the original Hindi song in their beatbox and I really liked the way it sounded so I thought you know what I really want to do my own version a bit faster a bit more up tempo um, and do a Bengali version of it. And after that, I think was my aim to kind of do at least one a cappella song per episode. Plus, I didn't even pay for studio time. Yeah, that's, bruv, studio time's expensive, you know. My whole shop got burnt down. Oh, but did you die? Tony Chang. Uh, Tony Chang is played by, come on, I don't, to, I don't need to tell you this stuff, man. Tony Chang is played by my best friend, Michael Troon, um, who is an amazing actor. I say this to his face and I'm saying it to you now if you're watching, you are 10 times a better actor than I am and you're going to go places bro, inshallah. But yeah, Tony Chang uh, was actually invented as a side character, um, he was just meant to make an appearance and then maybe pop up again in the near future, but you guys showed so much love to the character, I couldn't not tell Michael to come back and make a regular appearance. But what's funny is that in that scene, he came in with a Vietnamese accent, which was supposed to be Chinese, uh, but I think Michael was still kind of getting used to the role himself. Fun fact, if you listen to our podcast, The Director's Cut, we actually talk about Tony Chang and the character, and Michael actually said he used to sell DVDs when he was 12 years old. So that whole scene with Tony Chang, it's not made up. Michael actually used to do it, maybe without the accent, but Michael actually used to do it. <laughs> the song Michael sings um, apparently is a very popular Mandarin song. Ever since he sang it in the episode, I can't get it out of my head. What can I get ya? I make 500 quid on here, please. Michael Salami, oh my god. Um, Michael Salami was probably the first legit actor on the series. Uh, no offense to everyone else up to episode three. Me and Michael Salami met on set of Mandem and the Wall. Before that, he did a short film with Sebastian Till, and his performance was just amazing, man. And um, I shouted him, I said, Yo, bro, I got the series. I really want you to play a part. Um, he came down and believe it or not, that whole scene of the credit card and everything, it took a whole day just to film that scene because customers were coming in and out of the shop. Every time a customer came, we'd have to cut. So if we if we like bagged one line, like one part of his dialogue, um, that was safe. And then we had to move on to the next part of the dialogue. Even though the conversation was back and forth, he'd do one part, a customer would walk in, he'd do another part, a customer would walk in, We'd have to keep cutting. He was standing there, he didn't move for literally, I think 12, 13 hours, man. We got there at like 12 o'clock 
um, and we left when it was dark. But he showed so much dedication to me, man, and he just wanted to do it for the art. Up to this day, I will never forget uh, how much time he gave me to kind of do that scene. A few years later, man ended up on Hollyoaks, bro. Big up. Michael Salami, man. Every time customers would walk into the shop, we'd hear the same BS, man. Like, customers would walk in and be like, oh, get my good side. <laughs> or, oh, what you feel, man? Uh, EastEnders. Uh. Like, it was so annoying, bro. Health and safety inspector come. She shut me down. Find a rat. The rat in episode three was mine and Michael's idea. Because uh, Michael actually said a common thing in a lot of uh, Chinese takeouts is that they have rat problems. I don't know if that's true yet, so don't even attack me if, if I'm wrong. But uh, I told him the health and safety inspector was gonna make a visit, then he came up with this idea and we kind of merged it together. When you see the POV of the rat moving, we shot that on my phone, because uh, I wanted the quality to be lower. Obviously it's the vision of a rat in it, I don't know what that is. Might be shit, innit? Rats might need to go spectate for something, innit? They might not have 20-20 vision, innit? And it was actually Michael's idea to do the Hadouken. And the last fun fact I'll leave you with, Tony Chang's phrase, don't worry, uh, was actually an accident. Um, it became a thing, I think, after everyone watched the bloopers and he kept saying it. And then next thing you know, we just had a flood of tweets saying, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. Don't worry, but don't worry, but don't in worry. Who <laughs> <laughs> came in bed late, I'm not upset <laughs> but don't worry. <laughs> and it was from that day, Michael can never escape those two words. Don't worry. I hope you enjoyed that guys. If I did bring up any good memories for you, comment below, tell me what they were. Let's share this experience together. You can go back and watch episode three or binge watch the whole series. I'll be back next week and you can join me in the corner shop staff room where we can reminisce about episode four.